So this is the title of my talk, Lessons Learned Building an AI-First Browser Automation Framework in TypeScript. It might be the longest conference talk I've ever given title-wise, so let's just call it Lessons Learned Building, right? You all here are builders, you all write code in TypeScript. We built the TypeScript framework, and we're gonna talk about three segments of lessons. I can't combine them all together, so we'll do three sections. One is like, Lessons Learned Building a Browser Automation Framework, which is very interesting. Lessons Learned Building a Framework for AI, a state chance and AI framework, we'll talk about that. And then Lessons Learned Building a Good TypeScript Framework, and this is the section that will have all the holy wars, okay? So we'll save those for the end, and we can have hot takes at the very, very end. But let's talk about building browser automation frameworks. Uh, you know, as the MC said, you know, at BrowserBase, we help AI automate the web. And I promise there are AI agents that can automate the web in production. Yeah, if you haven't seen them yet, you might not have used some of the tools they're working on. We have thousands of customers at BrowserBase building real AI agents that can go out to websites and interact with them. The thing is, they're not doing any of that stuff she talked about. They're not buying tickets for flights. They're not you know, booking restaurant reservations. They're doing really, really boring stuff. They're looking for government contracts that are up for you know, RFP and sending in proposals. They're helping people go apply for scholarships or food stamps. They're researching all the different types of screws that go into different types of you know, aircraft and, and procuring them. Very boring, very enterprise use cases, but that's the type of software that AI can work on right now. But at BrowserBase, we're, we're helping AI use the web, right? And what do we do? So we provide browser infrastructure. That's like a browser running in the cloud. A browser is a service that you can connect to with code. We also provide some code. There's a lot of open source frameworks like Playwright, Puppeteer, and Selenium that allow you to connect to a browser. We have our own framework, Stagehand, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then we also have a bunch of things that you can use to plug in models. So you want to maybe generate this code to control a browser on the fly. You can imagine BrowserBase is like the browser tool for AI agents. And StageChain, our framework, is like the code interface for the browser. So StageChain, like I talked about, it's like a better version of Puppeteer, Playwright, or Selenium, um, but better. Uh, maybe show of hands, has anyone ever used those frameworks before? Puppeteer, Playwright, Selenium? You've often used them for testing, right? They're used for testing your front-end application. And maybe if you're uh, like me and you're an enterprising person, you've used them to try to do some scraping or some light automation. But they're testing frameworks that we use for automation or scraping. Uh, we built a framework that's automation first and AI first, where if you go to a website, you give it a natural language prompt, it will actually take the natural language prompt and turn it into an action. Now this is, works alongside Playwright, Puppeteer, Selenium. We're not trying to replace those frameworks. They're great testing frameworks. What we're trying to do is build a, a, a tool for someone to automate websites using natural language. And here's why. If you can use natural language, if the page subtly changes, it can regenerate that on the fly. This natural language converts to a selector on the page using a large language model. So StageChain really is a conduit from your natural language instructions to selectors and actions taken on the browser itself. And there's a lot of reasons why we think StageChain is great. And I'm, this isn't like a state champ pitch, I wanna talk about why we built it, but just for a second, like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's model agnostic, you can use any sort of LLM or VLM or computer use model with stage hand and we'll go out and automate the website. You know, once again, it's self-healing if the page changes. I've had to deal with so many broken scripts where I may automate a web workflow, the page changes, and all of a sudden my script breaks. So we really try and make stage the best way to automate the web, and our customers and developers really, really like using it. So, let me kind of walk through how it works one more time, right? So with StageHand, we take natural language plus the element of your choice to perform a browser action. With the, the framework is gonna create these prompts by taking the HTML of the page, parsing it into a more context-efficient version of itself. We use this thing called accessibility tree. Sometimes people use Markdown. Basically, HTML is so noisy, there's all these like weird classes and Flexbox and everything. Let's strip all that out, give it to an LLM and say, hey, help me find the button I'm looking for. From there, the LLM is gonna pick this thing called the candidate element they wanna interact with. It's if you're saying, hey, fill in this form, put in the date field. It's gonna find the date field and say, do the click command on this. So we give LLM the source of the page and then we say, here's the actions we want it to take. And then the outputs are then a selector. It's a CSS selector. So you can actually cache that selector. Maybe you use the inference the first time you interact with the page, but the second time, if the page hasn't changed, if you hash the contents of the page the same DOM, you can use that selector again. This idea of using LLMs to generate code to interact with web pages is very important because it creates repeatability and cacheability, reducing inference costs. And finally, stage is gonna take those actions. Now this part is like the smallest line, but it's the hardest part. How do you actually take some action generated by an LLM and, and control a browser? Well, we'll talk about the Chrome DevTools protocol and some of the work there. 
It's kind of cool. Stagehand is great. It, it works because it's a natural language. This is in Japanese. So you can prompt Stagehand in Japanese. And, and I think it's very interesting because like natural language prompts within code allow a lot more you know, uh, internationalization of frameworks than we had before. And Stagehand has a bunch of adoption in Japan. Same with um, Mastra, actually. Shout out to our Japan devs. They're really, really cool. And you can see it's taking some actions and, and controlling it. But there's some things we learned. You know, first of all, like, Chrome DevTools protocol is, is very challenging. In the README, it says, think twice before using the CDP for a direct representation. You should just use Playwright. And like, okay, cool, we listened. So we used Playwright. We listened to the README as you should, right? Obviously. Um, but Playwright had a bunch of painful limitations. Um, specifically, working with iframes in this thing called a shadow DOM, which is not some nightmare place, though I have had nightmares about shadow DOMs before. Um, it doesn't work with shadow DOMs very easily. So, okay, we can't do that. We have to rewrite the whole damn thing. So what we did in Stagehand v3, which just came out a week ago, was take Stagehand, which was previously built on Playwright, and directly integrate with the Chrome DevTools protocol. And if you've seen Playwright before, it's a very complex uh, framework. To be one-to-one -one compatible with all the actions you take on a browser is not easy. Um, but we did it, and it took a lot, a lot of time, and Sean was locked in for like three months. But you know, these are some benchmarks, and what we saw is that when you go to first principles, when you use the underlying protocols directly, and you don't use a wrapper library on top, you actually can get more performance. Some of these things we're talking about is like how long it took to interact with an out-of-process iframe, or OPF, or a uh, CSR as a shadow root, which is like a shadow DOM. So it turns out investing in these core primitives when you're building a framework is really important. And yeah, all browser automation frameworks just use the CDP directly. Uh, we're not the first to make this move, but I'm sure others will, especially because more and more people are gonna automate the browser. So let's talk about AI. Listen, we got three parts, we're one part there. So building a framework for AI is really interesting. Uh, I have to ask a little bit of a religious question. Are you guys agnostic? You know, but maybe like, are you model agnostic? Because if you're building, I think it's funny how we use that word. It's so religious in nature. I guess are you model neutral? Are you Switzerland? Because if you're building an AI framework, you need to support all these different models, right? We're not a lab. I'm not spending trillions of dollars on tokens. I'm gonna help work with any of the models you have. I'm gonna be kind of in the middle. And I think when you're thinking of building a new framework, which some of you might be, model agnosticness is very important. Uh, but it's a total pain in the butt, right? Like, are you gonna use light LLM on Python? Are you gonna use AI SDK? What's your wrapper? Are you using some sort of modeling? Maintaining all these model integrations is painful. Do you let the customer implement some sort of class to bring their own model? You have to think really carefully about that. We actually haven't found the right solution at, st at Stagehand, but if you're gonna be model agnostic, which you should, figuring out how to sustainably keep up with model releases is really important. Because holy crap, it sucks when OpenAI drops a model when I'm on like vacation, and all of a sudden I'm at my laptop like trying to add support into Stagehand. Uh, this is uh, this great guy, Ankur Guo. He said, "Thou shall make evals," um, and it's not just because it brings up a shareholder value, right? Uh, I do believe that you should tell your users what model they should use if you're building an AI framework. And at Stagehand, we've done this really nicely. We have like this whole page called Stagehand.dev/evals, and once again, because we're model agnostic. By bringing your model to our application, we're gonna show you how well each model performs and let you make good decisions. Because once again, like general evals are not useful or general benchmarks aren't useful if you're using them in your framework in a certain way. Show them some information. This is a great growth hack too. You can always say, like you can create beef. Like we have beef, like we're like, oh, actually Claude is the best model. And people at OpenAI are like, no, it's not. And like, well, that's engaging for our customers and according to our uh, evals it is. Maintain a benchmark, it's great. Good for the world, good for the community, good for researchers too, they wanna to see this. We've actually worked with all the labs, they're really nice and helpful. And I do think clinkers are open source's new best friend, and you need to consider our new user, our new customer, as we're building these AI frameworks. And I actually asked Claude Co last night, hey, can you help me set up Mastra uh, in this project? And I thought it was very interesting how, it, I actually got some good SEO insights here. You need to add 2025 to your search queries. But my point here is that AI should be able to one-shot your framework. If you're building an open source framework or building a tool, you need to be testing it in every AI tool. And even if you're like a Claude Code loyalist, you should be using Codex, I use ChatGPT, I'm using everything. I want every model to be able to one-shot my, um, my framework, and that's because that will be good developer experience, good, good AI DX, I think they're calling that AX. I'm just gonna say AI DX. So these are the three principles I thought about with building great AI frameworks. Now let's get into the last part of the Trinity, the Holy War, building good TypeScript frameworks. And I'll be the first to say I'm not the best person to speak to this. I think some really amazing TypeScript framework maintainers out there. I think the Master team does a lot of work here. The Gatsby team did before, of course. Um, I think the Next.js team, the React team. There's so many amazing TypeScript frameworks out there. Here's a couple of things that we thought about that are important to me as a developer. 
First of all, I think less is more. Stagehand is really only five APIs, really. It's this act call, which will take an action on a website. It's an extract call, which will pull structured data out of a page using an LLM. It's this observe call, which will help you like, do like Boolean statements like, is the submit button on this page, yes, no. Um, and there's like an agent mode, which will help do like, kind of like a simple agentic step if you want to do more complex workflows. Less is more, especially when you're building for AI. If you can have simple APIs, it's less context for it to understand. Minimal dependencies. Oh my god, this, I think there's a lot of bad offenders here. Some people are bundling the whole world into their package. Don't do that. Like less, be, be, have a lot of scrutiny. If you're publishing something open source, less is more on the dependency side. It helps, you're saving the rainforest if you do that. All right, every extra megabyte, killing a tree in the Amazon. Um, a clear readme in docs, obviously. Sometimes people like a video. Sam actually helped me write the readme for Satchand. Uh, and I'm a big fan of the MIT license. I just do think it's the most explainable, understandable license. Um, as Stagehand has gotten bigger, we've had to deal with competitors hosting Stagehand, but in the end, you do it for open source, you have to be intentional to open source, it's worth investing in, even if it gets a little annoying. So, MIT license, full stop. Talk to your users. I think people, like this is so obvious in company building, um, but I've met so many developers who've built frameworks just for them, and they've never talked to other developers while they're building it, and they build the perfect abstraction for them. It's like, this makes so much sense to me. And they put it out of the world, and it's an overcomplicated piece of you know, hot mess. Um, maybe affect.js to talk to the users a little bit more, just saying, um, hot take. But like, I do think talking to your customers, making it clear, understanding what the abstractions need to be, if you can do that, you're gonna build a framework that might be used by people. And that's what we're all trying to do here. We're trying to build something that's used by people and helpful for the world. I think level one is building something useful for yourself. And I'm not discouraging that. You should build stuff that's useful for yourself. But level two and level three is actually building something that people in your community use, people that other people start contributing to. You build something that lasts beyond you, is greater than you. And if you can talk to what other people need and blend those into your design of a great framework, it's meaningful. And you actually can build something really great. And I think that's what we've done at Stagehand. The last thing is to be patient. Uh, I think people think sometimes this stuff is like an overnight success. Like you'll see the GitHub star charts going crazy like this. You're like, oh my gosh, this thing is really popping off. Um, it doesn't work that way all the time. And I'll maybe walk you through a little bit of the state chance story uh, to show you how long it took to build a great framework. It actually started in uh, May 20th. This was my birthday, the day before my birthday, uh, where Jeremy was helping us out. And he said, hey, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna create this, like, here's the goals of this project. That was May 2024, right? We want to make this high-level automation thing, and we want to work for our customers. We're building this thing for our customers. We're not building for us, for, for users. Then we launched it in October 2024, did this video, got 30K views. It was okay, you know? Um, very happy with the first release. Uh, and it got like 2K stars by the end of the year. Remember, this is six months later, uh, and there are so many frameworks that have been really blowing up at this time. In terms of downloads, we weren't like, we were seeing positive signs. We were seeing people who really loved it, but it wasn't growing like wildfire on its own. I think that was the moment where we had to be really patient and say like, we're building this because we think it's important, we care about it, we think it's well designed, and as long as we keep talking about it, evangelizing it, more people will hopefully discover this thing and see where it slots in into the AI workflows. Fast forward all the way to November 2025, it's grown quite a bit, but you can kind of see it really didn't take off until early 2025. There was model quality issues like that improved when uh, Operator came out in January that was really useful for the world to understand what can happen. And, and now Stagehand is you know, one of the most popular AI browser automation frameworks. And that patience was just super important because I think there's many times as an open source maintainer that we want to give up along the way because we feel like all this hard work we're doing hasn't been recognized yet. But if you're patient with it, if you give it a lot of time, things happen slower than you may realize. And if you wait, it will pay off, especially if you're building something great with some of the principles I mentioned today. So, my name is Paul, I'm the founder of BrowserBase. Stagehand is open source, uh, PRs are welcome, and I hope you enjoy this talk, and feel free to reach out on X if you have any questions, okay? Thank you all very much, I really appreciate it. <laughs>